Yes. All right, we are live. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Abel, and this is Meg Mitchell. And we're, we are at the Abel Contemporary Gallery. Um, for those who may be unfamiliar, the Abel Contemporary Gallery is located in Stoughton, Wisconsin, which is just south of Madison. We represent about 100 artists in all media and have three concurrent exhibits about every seven weeks. Um, we are currently in our gallery space, gallery number five, um, and we are talking about things of a certain type, how to become a pet, a fabulous installation by Meg Mitchell, which is up through July 18th. So today during this um, talk with Meg, we are first gonna look at a video of the install and then we're gonna chat with her for a while and we'll finish things up with the question and answer period with the audience. At any time, if anyone has a question, you can just type it in and um, one of the staff people will um, read it at the end with Meg or we can just chat less formally at the end as well. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Meg. Multimedia installation artist Meg Mitchell creates immersive and enigmatic environments which inspire thoughtful dialogues. Her work has been featured in numerous group and solo exhibitions at venues such as the Atlantic Center for the Arts, Connor Contemporary, the DC Art Center, and the International Waldkunstzentrum in Germany. I hope I said that sort of correctly. Her work has been featured in many publications such as Art Papers, Art in America, and the Washington Post. Mitchell currently works as an associate professor in digital media in the Department of Art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This multimedia installation playfully explores the similarities and differences within categories and concepts using the formal language of domestic construction and interiors to ground the images and objects within. Um, and just a few, I'm gonna read just a little bit more um, about what Meg has to say about the installation and then we're gonna start talking um, to Meg. Um, so this installation asks, what happens when reality is translated through virtual and designed systems, when the animal natural world is extinct and when we adapt it for human needs and spaces. This work hosts a collection of 3D printed cat figurines curated and categorized by the artist alongside a furniture display system and video installation. The furniture echoes interior wall construction and a modular shelving system designed by Paul Cadovius in 1948, a, a classic of post-war interior design. Video of different specimens of maidenhair spleenwort, a wild fern in the British Isles, cycle rapidly through the visual field, which along with the collection of cats serve to remind us of the infin infinite diversity within seemingly narrow categories. So thank you everyone for joining us. And also um, we are taping this, so this can be watched at any time later um, at ablecontemporarygallery.com, which is just ablecontemporary.com. So Meg, thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Teresa. Um, so- Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, we're looking now at this video of this fern, yep. which is great. So, um, so the title of the show, Things of a Certain Type, How to Become a Pet. It's so curious and, and wonderful. Um, a little whimsical, is that fair to say? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of feel like in most of the things that I can say about my own work, which as we know is kind of difficult because I'm in it and I'm doing it, but I do tend to work on both ends. Um, and so uh, some of my work involves technology and coding and you know things that are very sort of like exhaustively uh, documented and, you know, iterated in large numbers in a kind of precise way. And then, um, uh, but I am also a fan of the sort of like whimsical gesture um, near, you know, usually um, when I'm in the middle of making a piece, I'll just kind of decide, yes, that's it, that's the title. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for people who haven't 
seen the show yet um, or and are just seeing this video or even for people who have seen it. Um, I mean, I went over very briefly, but let's sort of dig into the concept of this because there's there's a lot of there's a number of different things going on. And just so that everyone understands, Meg made all of the pieces. So Meg made the cats, Meg made the wall system. So she's and then she did the video. So there's there are a lot of different elements happening. So let's kind of go through them conceptually first. Well, so I guess I would maybe begin with an interesting concept that the show sort of probably or the installation probably uh, asks some questions about, and that is maybe what is it to make in contemporary society or in um, you know a, a sort of um, incredibly advanced you know, capitalist society that we find ourselves in. Um, so you know. Uh, and I think it may be even going as far back um, as Aristotle in terms of thinking, you know, what's the difference between having an idea and actually making something? Um, what's the difference between uh, crafting something with your hands and material and that or, you know, representing something? Um, and I think in, in art and in contemporary art in particular, um, those those are sort of, you know, incredibly active areas of um, inquiry. I also think that uh, the you know idea of making is something that, of course, you know we all still have access to, you know, using our hands in a very direct way. But there's lots of uh, practices that people would consider to be some sort of form of making that um, you know many many years ago may have, may could could have been considered a form of design. Um, and a, a form of um, idea making or plan making, and and I think that is a good bridge into the virtual world of you know this object. And I think when you look at any three D printed object, it, it begs the question: where you know this is um, a reproduction, like where is the original? Does the original even exist? If it's in bits and atoms, you know. Right. Um, and so, so I feel like it would be. Um, I feel like it would be disingenuous to to not sort of just be frank about the fact that my work is engaged with that with that dialogue. Of, yeah. You know, of what not not just what is making, but why is making. You know? Yeah. Well, and I think it, especially right now at this time, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, and also, I think although lots of people, whether you're painting a picture, obviously there's that mental part of it, and there's the the hands part, the crafting, mm -hmm. the object thing, mm -hmm. and every and artists are on a continuum of mm -hmm. one or the other of those. But you balance in that place really well. Oh, thank you. I try. <laughs> and, it's and, it's yeah, definitely yeah. hard because yeah. I feel like I grew up with digital tools, and um, but I also grew up with hand tools, and you know, learning. Um, from workshop techniques from my relatives, um, male relatives specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that 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 there's something about the virtual that for me is profoundly unsatisfying. And um, which isn't to say that I, you know, don't love living in the virtual and within a certain within a certain set of boundaries. <laughs> but then at some point, you know, I feel like I have to um, actually make something in the shop because I uh, I need I actually as an artist and these are things that maybe you just kind of as you go along the way as an artist you find out what's important to you um, and, and having some you know, like air quotes some kind of physical inter interaction yeah. with my with my work is is necessary yeah. for me to feel good about well, it. Well it connects with your thinking process yeah. your process. So let's get so we're so you've constructed kind of a room within a room. Mm -hmm. So you made these fabulous sort of wall slash shelving units, mm -hmm. um, which uh, mimic this shape of gallery number five. And then you have shelves and there's cats. So before we even, I want to talk about the ferns in a little bit because okay. we've talked about that and I know that's really interesting yeah. too. But um, so, so like for instance, we could, Think that we're the viewers in this space right now, and in a way, when I read the title, I think, "Have I become the pet? I'm inside this space, and you've created this space. Do I, am I entertained here with my shelf and my ferns and 
Was there any thought about that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we're pets right now. Yes. <laughs> I'm always a pet, yeah. uh, per personally. And I guess part of it is like, I mean, I do spend a fair, and when I say fair, you know, like a non-disruptive amount of time thinking about the mechanisms of advanced capitalism and how they're kind of like holding me in place, you know? <laughs> but, but I also sort of feel like, um, oh, there was this pandemic thing, you know, and we were all literally held in place yes. for a while. So I just felt like, oh my God, like I, I need one of those water bottle things where I can like, just like scratch up to it every day and I'm good, you know, like I, I'm contributing to society. Like I don't, you know, and it felt very self, you know, self-limiting and crazy making. So I, I just wanted to like acknowledge that we all kind of lived through that. You That's know? true. You were making a show during the pandemic. Yes. Was really, um, of course, but yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, well, and just like, I was also sort of thinking about like how much satisfaction I was getting out of curating my own environment, yeah. um, that that became like a major sort right. of go-to. And, and I had always sort of like, you know, probably had this not like the, this opinion that interiors weren't actually as important as we think they are. And so I don't know, I may be turning around on that now yeah, <laughs> after, right. after having, you know, been stuck in one for yeah. a while. And the cats are, I mean, there was, you know, there's some pictures here. Great. Thanks, Lauren. So they're, they're like, they're 3D printed, mm -hmm. but they're not trying to mimic real cats. They're not to scale a real cat. So they're, you're obviously very intentionally making them little figurines and yeah. tchotchkes yeah. and it's kind of romantic. So why are they these kind of romanticized figurines? Well, I feel like I, uh, you know, the, um, that's sort of how we experience, I think it's how we experience a lot of objects in our interiors, but yeah. I also think it has to do with how we experience pets, you know, right. which is like that they're diminutive and they're somehow, I, I mean, I don't personally believe this about my pet, but I think a <laughs> lot of people believe that their pet has, you know, um, faculties lesser than you know right. than ours and you know i think that so it's another option yeah. in their home yeah yeah it's like, don't ask me what i think of my pet because right you know, it's not a yes well that i mean i i think that that's a very um it's a very humanist way of thinking about it, it really privileges our own you know right. faculties and knowledge right yeah. i mean so yeah I just don't think it's a right. fair about way to evaluate. Right. So we're in this space and we are being entertained by our cats as pets. Um, and then there's the ferns. Well, yeah, as I, I would say, yeah, definitely as pets, but also as objects. Right. But, yes. I mean, most of them stay pretty animal, but some of them definitely veer off into the like, yeah, I'm, right. I'm a, I'm a vase or, yeah. you know, this kind of like, I've become an object sort of right. thing. Because um, like this one on the right that Lauren has a picture of, yeah, what that's sort of a half cat, half person. Yes, okay. and, uh, it, and <laughs> oh no, you mean the one? Yeah, no, yeah. she is like has a holding a cat on her oh, shoulder okay. while she uh, back backpacks around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, definitely when we uh, when I started looking at these sort of source files. Um, and thinking about, you know, even, I'm, we probably, when I say we, I mean me and my graduate assistant, Natalie Lambert, probably scoured like a couple hundred um, files. And then we sort of started to see ones that sort of um, exemplified an archetype in, in the volumes of just, I mean, which gets me back to make, goes back to making a little bit. It's like, in a world where there's so much data and so much out there that has already been done, is it, is it, do I really need to make another data point or would I rather make a comment about like all of the, the um, sort of soup of stuff, you know, that's making up that's our, our yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, I mean, it's, I know it's a, like, an, you know, a question that lots of other people have asked, but um, it seems like a, a I think it seems like a fair one. Um, no, it's a it's a completely fair question because I think again, 
whether you're working in digital media or even yeah. as a painter, you know, you jump in and you think there's this whole history of painting. What do I have to add yeah. to that? Is it relevant? Mm -hmm. You know, it is always. I mean, we're all sort of building on this lineage and as humans, we do that. But I think we all have to question that. Yeah. And it enriches the final product because we've questioned that. True. Um, so you were asking about- I want to know about the yeah. ferns now. What about them? <laughs> <laughs> there they are. That's not, yeah. that's not all of the ferns. There's yeah. probably about, I, I would say like in the set, um, there's probably uh, 60 or 70 of them. And I, I have, um, I took pictures of these when I was uh, out doing field work and I, uh, I probably captured, you know, maybe five to 600 unique uh, configurations of this particular fern and little specimens. And then I also uh, was photographing tons of other fern species too. And, and actually this was not what I was there, what I was supposed to be documenting. That's not, I mean, not that I wasn't supposed to, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a grant to say, oh, I'm gonna document this, you know, this fern in this context, which was in the, uh, the Victorian um, glass house context. And so that was the logic of sort of doing my travel. Um, but then when I got to um, the Isle of Butte in Scotland, they had these um, uh, just regular, you know, city um, stone walls that were just absolutely peppered with these little things. And um, I was, I guess I was just really charmed by them because they're just growing in the tiniest little crack in between the, um, in between the stones and the mortar. And um, I just, I, I found their resiliency to be just really incredible. Um, and also the sort of, you know, um, some of the, you know, just more interesting forms. Um, and, and the reason the forms are so tortured is because they're sort of tortured by the weather. Oh. Um, and, the, you know, just the wind and all kinds of stuff um, right. coming through on that whole island. So, but we were also, there was a, a conversation when in your research about ferns, where you were talking about ferns in the Victorian era. Yeah. Ferns. Well, that's kind of like, that's sort of the sco scholarly umbrella for all of my interest in ferns. It's okay. their sort of role in Victorian um, interiors. And um, the reason that ferns specifically were sort of prized for the Victorian interior is because you had, uh, you know, ladies who were ostensibly sitting in the parlor room, uh, you know, because they, of course, were not out in public life at the time. Um, and they, uh, the sort of preferred plant for a sitting room was a fern and you could have, you know, a hundred different kinds of ferns, um, but orchids were straight out. And the reason orchids were out is because they had plant sexual organs. And so the ferns, because they uh, propagate through spores and are, you know, in the plant world, asexual, um, the ferns were viewed as a sort of uh, safe or, you know, decent kind of um, plant to, you know, surround your, your ladies with. Um, <laughs> So, so I, I do I sort feel of like just call me. And yeah, me. yeah, thanks. Yeah. You want to start, start by it? No. <laughs> um, but definitely that one of the one of the things that I find so amusing about about ferns is that they they have this sort of really um, really ridiculous history within that sort of narrow era and um, into the Edwardian, um, and then people kind of got over it. Um, but uh, you know. They're, they're just a plant, like they don't care, right? right? And so yes. it's 100% it's a, a human invested narrative. Um, and so, yeah, I just find that kind of fascinating. Like, you know, what do the plants feel sexy? Like, I mean, <laughs> they might. They yeah. might, yeah. 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 That's... Wow. Well, so the other thing that I, so the show opened um, a few weeks ago and I have loved watching people come in and, and view the show. And I, some people I think don't realize that you made everything. So we sort of moved <laughs> to that earlier, but um, I think we should, I just want to spend a little bit of time sort of sure. first, like talking about championing you for like oh. all these skills that you have to work in all these media successfully. So, and that people realize that 
you may need, I mean, you had some assistance, but you have, you I, have know a, I do know how to ask for help. <laughs> yeah, but like you have a woodworking shop at yeah, your home. I do. Because I've been there and yeah. um, you made these shelves and they're beautifully made. And yeah. you made the 3D printed cats and you did the video. So yeah. I don't know, just talk a little bit about technically what you had to do to make it. Yeah, so so the shelves were definitely, I think the the cat archive was something that I worked on for a long time in the virtual space. Um, my, I mean, this sounds very not glamorous, but my uh, my graduate assistant and I make a Google spreadsheet. And then we just cut and paste links and, you know, identifying information. And, and then I ran it through some software to see if it could be hollowed. And then I sent them, you know, so there's a lot of just like, moving files back and forth and to different people to do different things. Um, and then and then they get printed, which is great. Um, and now I, I have to think back to like when I first started here at UW Wisconsin, I had my first uh, my first 3D printer that I actually fit, took care of myself. And that was fun, I say with sarcasm quotes. Um, and so it's actually like we have the fourth model up now um, and I can actually check on it from my phone when it's printing. Wow. So it has like little webcams in it. So it's just a, the, the world of 3D printing has come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, so I, I feel like um, there's definitely like a, a much more fluid workflow. Um, you don't need to like, uh, if someone has a low cost printer at home or something, they don't have to struggle through, you know, it not printing. Um, which was kind of how it was in the bad old days of, you know, five or 10 years ago. Right. Um, so, so that aspect of it is really kind of fun that it's almost like a, having a local service bureau. Um, but, you know, obviously like it's, if something, you know, goes wrong with the equipment, then, you know, me and, uh, our departmental technician uh, have to fix it. And then, um, so yeah, so the prints were super, super fun. and surprisingly easy, um, you know, relative to my sort of fraught past with 3D prints. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, this, the shelves took a lot of uh, time, uh, just a lot of time on the process because I'm superstitious about wood. So I wanted to give it lots of time to not be straight. Um, at every step of the production uh, kind of schedule. So, you know, every time I would do something like um, at school, I got a lot of uh, assistance from our um, uh, woodworking, new woodworking professor, Katie Hudnall, um, actually milling it because these, these uh, it's ash and these boards were giant. Um, so they probably weighed like at least 150, 200 pounds each. And uh, yeah, and so we had to like cut them, cut them into pieces. So yeah, milling it was a huge job. That was actually probably the biggest job of everything. Yeah. Even when you add in like, you know, it's the finishing and drilling and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always an adventure anytime I do a project. And I think, um, you know, one thing I, I like to do with, with projects, especially installation projects is, um, you know, just constantly think about, um, re them, you know, um, although I do feel like the, the ash is a, is a really great material to work with. It's, it definitely set, set me up for some challenges, yeah. mostly related to the weight of the, uh, of the wood itself, because I've been working with cherry a lot for my uh, previous pieces, and it's fairly lightweight, and this was like, um, oh, I've got a free to a weight training, right. Right. you know, but I mean, yeah, but yeah. it turned out all right. Yeah, and, and you made this, this show is new for this space, mm -hmm. and, and so you responded to this gallery space. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember drawing this, drawing the show. I, I do a lot of um, CAD models of things, you know, just to kind of fit them out in space. and. Um, I've certainly learned not to trust my CAD models, um, like in terms of, you know, space and um, just how you feel. But um, but I think that this one uh, is pretty close to what I had originally uh, envisioned for the space. I just made a couple of uh, changes, mostly related to the, uh, the material and what the yeah. material would, would do. Well, it's just perfect in here. 
It's just great. I, I do. Love, I do know it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, because if you when when you come to see the show, or if you see the show or check the video, the number five gallery space is in this old tobacco warehouse, and a lot of the walls are wood, and it has an open framework, so you can see some of the structure of the building. Yeah, which is just really beautiful with being able to see the structure of this walls and shelving and there's a little poetry to it so well I also really like I was a little bit you know this is one of those things where I just kind of keep this in my inside voice until the show is up but I was sort of like how is that modern stuff going to look in that tobacco oh. you know in that old tobacco warehouse and you know I'm quite happy with the way it looks yeah. it looks cool yeah. but I definitely was like hmm, I hope that I hope that works yeah. <laughs> you know? good Hey, so um, before we move along into the q and I just wanted, I'm curious, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. You, you have, so we've been talking about your studio practice, but you teach art at UW-Madison. I do. And um, that's, a, that's an intense job. So how do you balance, how do you find time to be in your studio? Is that challenging? Um. Well, and does the teaching yes. inspire you and, and add something to your studio? Um, well, yeah. Um, I was uh, just imitating my partner. If anybody knows my partner, <laughs> yes. Um, I think my teaching does inspire me uh, to make stuff in the studio uh, in a certain way. I think that I feel obligated to try new things and learn new things. Um, so that you know, I can constantly offer that stuff to the students. Um, I feel like within my set of you know interests, I stay fairly up to date on like you know the how of it. Um, and so I think that's something that I definitely do through my studio practice. Um, I feel like the exposing students to new work is also another way that I can just kind of push myself out to see certain artists that I might not otherwise see. Yeah. Um, because I think that the stuff that I show my students is usually much broader than what I would go and look for for myself if I were doing research for my own work. Yeah. So that's mostly because I teach a beginning class. And that's what I, one of the things that I really like about that layer, about having that beginning class, uh, at least in terms of, you know, what I get out of it personally. Um, although, you know, also I would say seeing the students, you know, when they're freshmen and then, you know, do great things as graduate students in the future or whatever. I mean, of course that's super rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we've got so many students to be proud of. So that's, great. yeah. And you clearly find time to get work done. I do. Yeah. I mean, I think part, part of, um, one of my uh, friends in grad school, I remember um, sitting around with my friends, uh, working, which was sort of like partying, but kind of like working. And, you know, it's like, we're all just kind of hanging out. And um, this one friend was like, Meg, like, I just realized how, how you get your, get, make your, how you get all your work done. And I was like, oh, how? She's like, we're trying to have a goddamn party and you're coding. <laughs> Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and so, so then basically I just, you know, at that point I was sort of like, okay, well, I guess this is, this is how I do it. You yeah. know, like, I mean, you can't, I don't, I, I hate that myth that you can have everything because like, I think it sets people up for failure. Yes. I feel like saying something like you can, you know, you can make your art if you go to, you know, two fewer social obligations a week is a little bit more realistic. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So yeah, you, you know, it's just, I do sort of feel like um, it can be a lot though. And um, yeah, you know, I just try to um, be nicer to myself than I was, you know, when I was a student. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. Great. That's me. Hey, um, so we're also, so we're here with Lauren Miller, an associate at Able Contemporary and Anna Leslie, the assistant gallery director. Um, and 
Um, wondering if we have any, well, one, do either of you have any questions for Meg? And then do we have any questions from the audience? Hello, Meg. Hello, Meg. Hi. Um, <laughs> so I don't have any audience questions at this point, but I have been thinking a lot about your use of cats in your show and the sort of ubiquitous nature that they have on the internet. Yeah. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about why you chose cats and and sort of the process of taking these images that you found on the internet and bringing them back into the tactile world. Yeah, good question. Okay, um, <laughs> so, so I chose cats uh, because well, as you identified, their ubiquity is certainly, you know, something that I felt like, um, I think that there's, uh, like, if I go back to that idea of like play, playing both, so both sides or playing both ends, you know, I feel like this is maybe not the most accessible or not the most sort of, um, you know, it's not, doesn't give its narrative away very easily unless you ask me for it. <laughs> <laughs> where I feel like the cats are very much uh, like performing in a very different way for the audience. And so I, I feel pretty strongly that um, seduction in any form is okay. And even if it's, even if it's cats. Um, and uh, if, if- As long as it's not plants. No. Or ferns. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, I do. I do uh, feel like there is um, people's love for cats, which is like kind of independent of of this, but also maybe getting kind of like that exer that muscle exercised a little bit. You know, like I'm asking you to indulge me in your love for cats. <laughs> yeah, so we, we just had Reed Schoonover call uh, the gallery and he left a message asking, um, saying one, he really is enjoying this talk. And um, if you could, if you see uh, cats domesticating us at all. Oh, absolutely. And that's definitely part of the how to become a pet thing, right? Because I do feel like my cat, well, obviously I have a cat, just one. And um, my cat has trained us into a variety of routines that we never thought we would do. Um, you know, he's like a, almost like a hobbit in terms of his uh, demands for frequent meal times. So, so yeah, it's, it's a little ridiculous and it is definitely something that, um, that I, I feel like, I guess I'm not really interested in art that takes itself so, so seriously, you know, um, because I feel like there's, uh, you know, there's a place for being aloof and then there's a place for maybe trying to actually communicate with people. <laughs> and do you want to plug your own cat's Instagram account that? <laughs> oh, sure. If anyone wants to see the, the real inspiration, uh, he's a norbert.smokycat on Instagram. Norbert's pretty awesome. It's a good cat. Absolutely. <laughs> and very photogenic. I mean, all he cats is, are. He is, especially photogenic, yes. Yeah. We, we had a question come in from Derek Bish. Um, he said, my question is, can you please talk about the current show in relationship to the work you did last summer, the public art project in front of your house? Yeah, that's, wow, Derek, that's very perceptive. That's a great question. Um, I, I feel like um, I did a piece last summer um, that sort of addressed uh, domestic abuse in the context of uh, an interior um, wall. And, it, uh, and that really was the first time that I've, in my work, that I've ever really t talked about or thought about the, the interior domestic environment so so that would be the clearest linkage is that it's I started thinking about you know walls and being inside and so you know people all this see that stuff. show just very briefly tell us what there's so it was like a it was like a wall and a another wall like a corner of um kind of 
uh, pine uh, wood paneling. And then I, I, I kind of indexed and CNC'd uh, stories that I had told about my sort of, you know, bad, terrible, awful <laughs> experiences in houses. And so these sort of um, carvings were just kind of running down the walls. Um, and I, I feel like, um, I feel like there's some future where that piece and this piece kind of mosh together, but I don't really like, I didn't want to go on this. I didn't want this, this work to be so much about the surface. I wanted it to be more about the structure. And that's such an interesting question um, because I had actually in the last couple of weeks thought about like, oh, I really need to like bring, bring back some like flat or you know not flat surface but like a constructed surface or something as i continue to develop the work that's great yeah good question derek <laughs> that's all we have for questions that's all, all we right. have for questions all, all right. right um i have an answer to a question that i, I just asked myself um <laughs> and that is uh <laughs> yes um, why is my cat not in this show? And I feel like the worst cat mom now. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. I didn't plan it. So you need to, um, first you need to three somehow. Well, we have a scan. We have a scan oh. of him sleeping. So now there's really no Yeah, excuse. I know. It's just. You can still add to the show. You can print that tonight and bring it tomorrow. <laughs> I'll just slip it in before we get Uh-huh. That's great. Well, yeah, what fun questions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more. Um, I can hear the phone is ringing, so just in case the question. But um, just, to, just to remind people, um, the show is Things of a Certain Type, How to Become a Pet. And the show is up through July 18th. Um, it's really fabulous. The gallery is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 5, and we hope that you can join us. If you are out of the area or unable to join us, um, there is a video of the installation on our website, ablecontemporary.com. There's a show page for this specific show that there's a link through on our homepage. And then um, there will also be a link on that page to this talk after the fact, if you want to watch it again or share that information with anyone. And it's also available on Facebook. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thanks, Ann and Lauren. Thank you, Meg. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. It's lovely is, to be here. Yeah, it's just an outstanding show. And this has been so interesting. And I loved getting all this insight into the work. And um, thanks. Yeah. It's been really interesting to chat about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. It's Every, like, everyone knows so much more than I do. About it. No. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, it it's a like rich sometimes. and layered show, yeah. and it's really, it's really great. It adds so much more to to hear about what your thinking process. So, yeah. thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye, everybody.